Hello and welcome to this presentation on vector bone diseases. My name is Kenneth and in today's presentation we will be looking at some of the vectors, the insights, symptoms, detection, treatment and mitigation of vector bone diseases. The gist of this lecture is to understand vectors, the different types of vectors, the vector bone diseases, the symptoms associated with these diseases, risk assessment of vectors and risk mitigation. I am currently uh, broadcasting from Borneo which is located just here. It's marked with a red outline and this is an island which encompasses uh, uh, East Malaysia as well as the kingdoms of Brunei, uh, Sarawak, the state of Sarawak and uh, a part of Indonesia, Kalimantan. Now within Borneo we have these species of primate which is Nasalis larvatus. It is a proboscis monkey and it is characterized by this unique nose and this Primate is essentially a host for Plasmodium nolzai. Now, Plasmodium nolzai is transmitted from the primate to human hosts, especially those villagers who are living in close proximity to forested areas. We should be aware of the different kinds of vectors and the diseases associated with the vectors in order to mitigate the risk posed by these vectors. We should also be aware of the symptoms, the risk assessment and risk mitigation strategies and the current trends in research and development. Now vector bone diseases contribute to about 400,000 global deaths on an annual basis. This is far lower as compared to heart diseases, stroke and lower respiratory infections which contribute to the lion's share of death in the world today. Given the current case of the coronavirus, vectors can no longer be taken for granted. So in the case of coronavirus, we had the VAT, so we have a zoonotic virus and this virus is transmitted to humans via some event which may have altered the spike proteins and this has enabled the virus to infect humans and then spread globally. Now vectors can no longer be ignored primarily because we do not know a significant amount of information pertaining to the interaction between the vector and the pathogen itself. This is why all uh, emerging threats should be treated with caution. The key aspect of controlling the spread of the infection is containment. So containment involves the containment of the patient itself or the infected individual as well as containment of the vector and the pathogen. And this containment can go a long way in protecting the community. Why has the prevalence of vectors increased in current times? One of the reasons may be related to anthropogenic influences on the environment. So there have been increasing incidence of deforestation and perturbation of natural equilibria. This has led to the disturbance of the natural equilibria between the vector and the natural environment. For instance, some mosquitoes may be infected in the wild by fungi which will be pathogenic to the mosquito. However, elimination of the forest habitats eliminates its fungi and disturbs the balance between the pathogen as well as the mosquito. And in this case, there is an overabundance of mosquitoes primarily because of the loss of their pathogen. Another factor is climate change. So perturbation of the global climate has led to a resurgence of malaria in certain countries such as North America as infections surge in Central America. So there have been increases in the 
incidence of malaria in the continental United States primarily because of the uh, emergence of malaria in Nicaragua and Venezuela. Now, with regard to the indicators from Goa, these are the following cases which have been reported as of September 29 and are available in the public database. We have malaria, 200 cases confirmed, dengue, 217, Japanese encephalitis and chikungunya is 89. Let us begin by looking at mosquito borne diseases. And this is Anopheles stephensi. So globally, we have a record of around 229 million cases. Now, one must remember that these are the reported cases. Uh, there may be cases which are unreported primarily because the location is rural. Uh, in the case of malaria and dengue, most of the cases are in sub-Saharan Africa where the communication network is relatively poor and there is very low reportage of cases. The number of reported deaths again is about half a million and these are the reported deaths and tragically this mosquito bone uh, vectors infect children who are less than five years of age and who do not have the requisite immunity uh, to provide resistance against uh, mosquito bone vectors. Now, malaria is nothing new. In fact, a study done with um, DNA derived from Egyptian mummies in which the DNA from mummies was extracted and then specific what are known as probes or primers were utilized to amplify the protozoan parasites indicates that Egyptians in the Nile Delta were also victims of malaria or may have been exposed to malaria almost three to 5,000 years ago. So. The prevalence of these parasites is nothing new, it's nothing novel, it's just that we have encroached on their habitats and this has led to an increase or an expansion in their range or their host range. Now Charles Louis Alphonse Laveran is the first scientist who discovered the unicellular eukaryotic protozoan which is the causative agent of malaria. Earlier it was unknown. It was assumed that the mosquito was the carrier of some unknown agent until Laveran discovered that this agent was actually a unicellular protozoan which is an eukaryote and subsequently research has led us to discover the complexity of this protozoan because it can change its antigenic principles rapidly and can also develop resistance to the first line drugs which are used against it. Now these are the five known Hals uh, plasmodium strains and so we have plasmodium halciparum is the first species which is the most common and we have some such as plasmodium nolzai which are very rare and associated with primates. So this is the overview of the different plasmodium species which are currently available or at which have currently been reported. Of course there may be some subspecies but they have no clear records of those. Now in order to understand vectors we have to understand their life cycle and this life cycle is just 8 to 10 days from the eggs, laying of eggs to the hatching of the adult mosquito. This life cycle becomes pertinent when you look at it from the perspective of climate change. For instance, if you have continuous rain and then you have flowing water, you'll have the less likelihood of these vectors developing. However, if you have intermittent rain with periods of rain and then you have periods of sunshine, the mosquitoes get a chance to lay the eggs and then continue with their life cycle and that leads to an increase in their host range because they can migrate out of areas which to which they are endemic. Now, the process of ingestion of the sporozoites or the uh, protozoan is quite complex. 
because a certain aspect of their life cycles occurs in the mosquito and certain aspect of their life cycle occurs in the human host. So assuming that we have a host who is already infected, the asexual form of the plasmodium does not is not transmissible by the mosquito. So when a mosquito bites an uh, infected individual, they, they uptake two gametocyte stages which are the male and the female form of that particular plasmodium. They also ingest uh, the asexual form of the plasmodium. However, once the gametocytes enter into the mosquito host, there's a difference in temperature. Now, when there's a difference in temperature, you have the formation of the microgametes uh, and then you have the formation of the zygote and the oocinids. And this oocytes formation essentially occurs in the gut of the mosquito. Once the oocytes are formed, then the, oocysts, the, uh, the, the release of the sporozytes occurs via the salivary glands. And these sporozytes are then transmitted into the host and they continue with their life cycle in the human host. So that's an overview of the process of propagation and reproduction of the plasmodium. Now what happens in the human host is very interesting. There's a process known as gametocyte commitment. So this gametocyte commitment leads to their male and female forms of the sporozytes. So these are termed as gametocytes and once these gametocytes enter the mosquito, the zygote formation and subsequent processes occur within the mosquito. This is an indication or a diagram which shows what actually happens in the gut of the mosquito. Now all of these green cells represent the gut, so the midgut epithelial cells and the process of formation of the oocyst occurs in the basal lamina of the epithelium and this oocyst then enter via the salivary glands back into a new host. So the process is very complex. In fact, the drugs have been developed to treat uh, the uh, metabolic processes in these oocytes. Now the symptoms associated with Malaria, uh, acute febrile illness, which means you will have a fever. And this usually occurs 10 to 15 days after exposure. So there's a long duration between the exposure to the plasmodium as well as the manifestation of the symptoms. You will have fever and chills and severe anemia in children. And this is why it causes mortality in young children. There's, there are, have also been cases of cerebral malaria because the protozoans can cross the blood brain barrier and then enter the brain and that's when it becomes life threatening. Some of us may develop a resistance or a immunity to malaria and in this case we become asymptomatic carriers and this is especially true in regions of the world where there is a endemic presence of the parasites. So if you are from a region in which the plasmodium is endemic and then you move to another region where it is exotic. For instance, you move from the Africa to Europe. There is a likelihood if there is the presence of the mosquito vector, you can transmit it to others, even though you are an asymptomatic carrier. Now, all of the treatment for malaria must be done within 24 hours of the onset of symptoms or else it progresses and it can become life threatening. So how is malaria diagnosed? So the first thing which is done is you have a smear, the blood smear, and then you have the microscopic observation. However, microscopic observation is limited by the number of experts. You may not have a sufficient number of experts in your community hospitals to identify these parasites because you have to look through blood smears and you should be able to identify the morphology of the blood cells, the red blood cells. The easier techniques are using the polymerase chain reaction. So this polymerase chain reaction uses special probes. It does not require expertise in identification based on the visual or microscopic observation. 
Uh, this relies on a polymerase chain reaction which can be done by a technician and you can identify the specific species of plasmodium purely by looking at the PCR product. The other method is a detection using fluorescent antibodies. It's similar to an RTK, but this is done using microscopy. And then we have specific fluorescent antibodies which target the plasmodium present in the blood. Now, fluorescent antibodies are expensive. As compared to this, PCR is the method of choice because it's reproducible and reliable. And you can work with even small volumes of blood. Now, there is a traditional uh, approach to avoiding mosquitoes, which we were told during our childhood, and that is avoid dawn and dusk because mosquitoes are most active during that period of the day. So, this is one of the things which has come via tradition, but uh, studies have proven that mosquitoes do uh, bite during the day as well. Now, what attracts mosquitoes to individuals is the carbon dioxide as well as the body temperature. So, the heat, the body heat itself serves as an attractor to the mosquito. There are also odorants, uh, which are floral perfumes, which may attract mosquitoes, sweat. And there are synthetic attractants such as uh, R-octanol. And in fact, some of the uh, researchers even use old dirty socks in mosquito traps because that order attracts mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are also attracted to certain uh, optical wavelengths of light, for example, blue and green spectra, and this can be used in traps. Now, prevention and treatment should be always done in consultation with a uh, registered medical advisor or a doctor. This is because there has been a lot of development of drug resistance due to indiscriminate use of the frontline drugs such as chloroquine. And this in turn uh, reduces the effectiveness of these therapies. There have been a development of the what are known as the derivative products of chloroquine which are also used for uh, prevention and treatment. So you can prevent usually we before we go off into a like a travel into a rainforest or into a area which is known to be having malaria we can do uh, we can take a treatment as a prevention uh, for example chloroquine however this has also toxic effects on other organs of the body such as the eyes and the liver so it's not recommended unless you are planning to go into an area which is like swarming with mosquitoes and which has a known history of malaria. So chloroquine is one of the first drugs which was used and it was discovered by Johan Andersag. It has a long-term toxicity to the host and uh, currently the protozoans uh, like Plasmodium have developed a resistance to chloroquine. In fact, they have developed a complex method of pumping out chloroquine from their cells and avoiding the toxicity. Okay. So this is an evol evolutionary process. The other drug which was developed or uh, discovered in China by the Nobel laureate 2UU is actually artemisinin. So it's from a herb or it's a plant which is uh, Artemisia annua and she discovered this uh, drug and in fact she discovered it because she referenced old material in the herbal pharmacopoeia in China. So she has read through the uh, drugs which were discovered by the early practitioners, maybe three to four thousand years ago. And then she focused on this one plant and she discovered this drug and she purified it and it has been synthesized. And for this, for her efforts, she was awarded the Nobel Prize. So currently there are no approved vaccines for Malaria. This is because the vaccine has to trans, has to target the antigen located on the protozoan, and this becomes very difficult because the antigenic variation, which means that the protozoan is constantly changing its antigenic uh, display, and this is why it is extremely difficult to develop a vaccine for uh, Plasmodium. 
Now, some companies have developed vaccines such as the GlaxoSmithKline uh, Biologicals and you have the whole sporozyte vaccine which is from Sanaria. This is essentially the whole uh, sporozyte uh, and similar to a viral vaccine, it has been inactivated and the antigenic principle is presents itself to the host immune system. Now, one of the major hindrance to the development of vaccines has been the poverty associated with sub-Saharan Africa. And if you see in the current context, when a vaccine is required by a developed country, you'll have immediate development. Here, vaccines develop within a year. But when it comes down to sub-Saharan Africa or the poorer countries, usually there's a lag in the development of vaccines. We now move on to our next important vector, which is Aedes aegypti. Now, Aedes aegypti is associated with the transmission of the dengue virus. Dengue virus is a flavy virus. And when we refer to these viruses, which are transmitted by insects, we refer to them as arbor virus. So they are arthropod bone viruses. And dengue is one of the viruses which is a single-stranded RNA virus. Now, the reason why a virus becomes uh, extremely active when it's single-stranded is because the virus itself, which is a single-stranded RNA, is recognized by the host as a self-molecule, which means that the messenger RNA, which is present in our cells, is similar, almost similar to the RNA from viruses. This is, includes the coronavirus as well. So all positive SSRNA viruses are translated into protein by our cellular machinery easily as compared to the other viruses which are the DNA viruses. So this flavivirus virus is transmitted by the vectors Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. There are four serotypes of dengue which means that you can be infected four times okay you won't you'll develop immunity maybe to the first one then you have two three and four and this is very dangerous in a place where you have dengue as an endemic uh, virus there have been 100 to 400 million infections reported per year and the treatment for levy viruses is based on case by case so yeah, some of the traditional native practitioners in in this in the location where I am even use papaya use the papaya leaves the bitter papaya leaf the juice is supposed to be associated with uh, recovery from dengue virus uh, that's what the herbal practitioners uh, adopt in this part of the world so the dengue virus is uh, enveloped with a capsid and then you have the genomic RNA. So this is a graphic representation of the virus. So it's like most RNA viruses. It's transmitted very easily and it's translated very easily within the cell as well. Now with dengue, it's some kind of a paradox that very few of the infected individuals display symptoms. One in four. If you have uh, dengue, it will progress to severe dengue. That is the dangerous one. And when you have severe dengue, you require immediate medical attention, which may involve the intravenous. Uh, you have to take fluids intravenously, or you may even require blood transfusions. So one of the things about dengue is you have a fever, and then you, you feel your eyeball, and you'll feel the ache behind your eye, especially the muscles of your eye. You'll feel a drawn sensation, and you'll also feel your joints and muscles like uh, aching it will be an ache without doing exercise you still feel ache then you have rashes that's uh, less common but the aches are very common you will recover within the week and you will have some kind of resistance to dengue okay now if you have blood in the stools or in your vomit if you have like diarrheal uh, incidents where you have blood in your stools you must be very careful and immediately contact a practitioner, a medical pr uh, practitioner, and then you have to get hospitalized because it will progress to severe dengue and that is deadly. 
Now, dengue virus is detected via the similar method which is used for coronavirus, which is the reverse transcription, quantitative PCR. It can detect very low copy numbers of the virus. And as we have dengue uh, in our region of the world, which I am currently living in, we always uh, refer to the paracetamol. We carry paracetamol whenever we go for field trips because we always take paracetamol, not the other painkiller. So paracetamol is basically used to uh, treat your pain, to manage your pain, but it should be taken only in emergencies if the pain becomes unbearable. And the second thing is to stay hydrated. Now, there is a vaccine for dengue, which is not approved in India. It's approved by the FDA. It's from Sanofi Pasture and it's Dengue Vaxia. So now this is a live attenuated virus. Now, what has happened with this vaccine was that when it was tested in the Philippines among school children, because Philippines also has a high incidence of malaria and dengue, um, there were two adverse reactions. And because of that adverse reaction, it is recommended to be taken by only those individuals who have been previously infected with dengue. Uh, this is one of the things about dengue vaccines. If you take it, if you, for instance, if an individual who has not been infected with dengue previously takes the vaccine, he or she will have an adverse reaction or is most likely to have an adverse reaction. One of the approaches which has been taken by the United States to control or mitigate the risk posed by the dengue bearing mosquitoes which are the Aedes aegypti is to utilize GM mosquitoes. So genetically modified mosquitoes are labeled with a fluorescent protein so you can expose them to UV light, uh, black stripe UV light and you can see the signature of the fluorescent protein so that enables or facilitates their location in the wild once they are released. Now, the male mosquitoes uh, have, carry a mutated gene and then that gene is what is known as a self-limiting gene. It's like a terminator gene. So after the male is released, he will fertilize the female and the self-limiting gene will terminate the female before maturity. So that breaks the life cycle of the mosquito. Now, almost a billion mosquitoes have been released in countries such as Brazil and in uh, South America as well. And in the USA, uh, release of these mosquitoes requires a clearance from the EPA and other regulatory authorities. Uh, this is controversial uh, because they are GM mosquitoes. There have been issues uh, or instances where many NGOs have opposed the release of GM mosquitoes because of the risks uh, associated with the transmission of genes outweigh the benefits of the, this particular mosquito which is control of the vector. Another very promising uh, area of containment or another method is the Wolbachia. So Wolbachia is a gram-negative bacterium which is associated with many insects. In fact, some of the insects cannot complete, complete their life cycles because of the absence of the Wolbachia. So they will get uh, terminated prematurely or certain critical vitamins are not produced in the, the insect host and that leads to their early mortality. Now Wolbachia regulates the reproductive cycle and it can reduce the lifespan of mosquitoes. Certain strains will increase the lifespan, certain strains will reduce the lifespan of the mosquito. Now, in trials in Indonesia, the prevalence of dengue was reduced by 77% by the employment of Wolbachia. Now, Wolbachia is fed to male mosquitoes or female mosquitoes as the case may be with the strain. And then these mosquitoes are released and they transmit Wolbachia to their progeny and the cycle goes on and on. The only thing is one has to identify the correct strain or the correct variant of Wolbachia which will facilitate the uh, reduction in lifespan. Now, chikungunya is another virus and it has similar symptoms uh, once uh, as compared to dengue. 
So this is also a arbovirus. It is a single-stranded RNA virus. And again, the vectors are the same as dengue. The detection of this is done by a molecular method. So basically the same protocols. So dengue, Zika and chikungunya have the similar protocols for detection, which is the real-time quantitative PCR or reverse transcription quantitative PCR. And uh, generally, uh, individuals develop immunity after recovery. Similar symptoms to dengue, the fever and joint pain and the muscle pain. And in some cases, there may be incidence of long-term arthritis. Now, the other vectors which we are going to talk about today are houseflies. So houseflies, as we know, are dirty. We associate them with dirt. However, they have almost a million bacteria on their bodies. So the main uh, mode of transmission uh, in this case is their house flies will constantly eat and regurgitate on food. So they will vomit and when they uh, regurgitate, they transmit these bacteria onto the food. Okay? So they are responsible for the transmission of uh, different types of pathogens associated with shigellosis. You have the salmonella, the typhoid. Cholera, you may have Vibrio cholerae and the other coliform bacteria which is associated with fecal matter. So, houseflies, although they appear to be quite benign, are a major source of many of the pathogens. They are the vector for many pathogens. Now, I am not sure if you are aware of sandflies or whether you have bitten, been bitten by sandflies. When you go to the beach, you will have uh, almost no sensation. There's almost no bite because the sandfly is very small. It's about three to five millimeters in size. So when a sandfly stings you, you can't feel it. But within three to four hours, or on the next day, you'll get a very big swelling. It'll be so itchy. It'll itch you and itch you and itch you for many days. Now these sandflies are associated with what is known as Kala Azar. So they will transmit a Leishmanias. So you will have this particular protozoan introduced into your system and it will then travel and it may uh, propagate through your system and this it results in the manifestation of the symptoms of leishmaniasis now the control of sandfly is difficult because sandflies do not require unlike mosquitoes they do not require a water to breed they will breed in rotting vegetable matter in the forest and in moist and dark locations. So a small film of water is all that they need to breed. So sandflies are not that much of a threat in your region of the world. They are in uh, this region of the tropics because uh, almost every visit to the beach results in a sandfly uh, sting and the associated uh, symptoms, which is a rash. Now, Having uh, learned about some of the vectors, there are many vectors. However, we cannot cover all of these vectors within this short presentation. We move on to what can be done for your community from the biorisk management perspective. Now, in order to break the chain of infection, we have to understand the vector in terms of the habitat, transmission and susceptibility. The first aspect is the habitat. What habitat does your vector inhabit? Where does it propagate? What's the life cycle? The mode of transmission, how does it transmit? Does it, uh, is it a reservoir of the virus or does it require to transmit a reservoir from a animal host or a human or a human to human host? The, the third one is susceptibility. Susceptibility refers to the treatment protocol. Is the vector susceptible to treatment with certain chemicals? Can it be eliminated from the environment using certain approaches and things of that nature? So in order to conduct a thorough uh, management strategy to contain vectors, we have to do what is known as biorisk assessment. And we can do it very simply in our community. We must assess the risk based on a priori and real-time data. I will get into that in the next slide. So risk assessment is done by enumerating the mosquito population but how can you do that in your community you can't go around counting mosquitoes and you don't have the time for that so there are methods 
which can be used to enumerate the uh, mosquito population. After you enumerate the population, you have to mitigate the risk by the application of adequate controls. Now, I have specifically used the word adequate because in many cases, overuse of pesticides results in the development of resistance. This is very common in mosquito where they have developed uh, resistance to many of the commonly used uh, insecticides, pesticides, larvicides, you have resistance. And finally, the third step in the process of uh, management or what is known as bi-risk management, we assess the performance of the controls after the application, which means essentially if you put in your traps in June, uh, then you carried out your treatment or your mitigation with either using chemical methods or physical methods in August, you assess the performance in September or you assess it in real time based on the case profile as well as the population dynamics. Now, one of the things which has been helping us a lot in controlling vectors in the global scenario today is big data approaches. Today, there is a real time data explosion. So, good science is based on analyzing data and making decisions based on the data. So that's the term which is used commonly now, which is data driven decisions. And that is the big data approach. This is a website which I will share with you and it will provide you with real time data or emerging data based on the currently available public databases. As you can see, the distribution in India is uh, limited, but you can see the case in Africa with the reds, which are very high incidence of the uh, specific vectors. So this is a very good website, which is from the Malaria Atlas, which will enable you to track um, the pathogens as well as the vectors across the world. Now, how do we conduct risk assessment? And again, you will have to refer to your local authority because in some communities, uh, you may not be allowed to conduct a risk assessment as a private citizen or as a group of citizens. You may have to conduct it in collaboration with your health service provider, your municipal authorities. So we comply with the regulations. Okay. So one of the ways which is we, what is done over here is we have volunteer groups and we document activities using social media. So that gives coverage of the activities. It also alerts the um, government or the local authorities to changes in the demographics of the mosquitoes. We look at areas which are conducive to the breeding of vectors. However, in this case, also you have a limitation because you can't go and fill up every uh, thing, uh, every pond and every, uh, it's not viable. So the best way to do it is to address this um, mosquito uh, population using the surveillance system. And that is by using insect traps. So you also monitor environment for changes in topography. This is being done in big data as well using uh, applications in Google Earth. And generally that's what constitutes the big data approach. But for us from a community aspect or the practical uh, value is to set up traps. So what is done is a surveillance using traps. Okay? There are two types of traps. One traps all mosquitoes using a net. So you have an attractant in the trap, which is usually carbon dioxide. You can take some jaggery or sugar and add some yeast and that will actually serve as an attractor to mosquito and then you design a trap so the mosquitoes enter into the trap and they get uh, asphyxiated with the CO2 and eventually drown. So there, there are traps. I can show you these diagrams in the subsequent slide. And there are also what are known as gravid traps. Gravid traps is actually a mesh placed on the water and the female will lay the eggs through the mesh into the water but the mosquitoes will not be able to escape once they hatch. Okay, so that's a gravid trap. And you also have traps which can be used for love, uh, for bioactive compounds. Okay, this is an example of a gravid trap. So you have instructions and the reference here is from Barrera et al. And this is recommended by the CDC and WHO. So this trap can be constructed simply using a black plastic container. And if you follow the instructions in the reference material, you can construct this trap and set it up in your community. And this is another type of trap, which is a mosquito trap. And this one will have a larvicide. So when the mosquito settles on this trap, it will carry the larvicide into the next place it visits. And it will get, either it will be um, 
there'll be mortality. You will have the mosquito will die, or it will have uh, eggs which are sterile. So there are many ways in which you can control uh, mosquitoes by using larvicidal uh, chemicals. Okay. Now this is an earlier version of the trap, which has a CO2 generator as well using dry ice. It's quite. It's one of the older traps. But it, the key point to remember is that traps should be located within a residential zone at predetermined locations. You may have to consult with your local authority because uh, you have to locate these traps at places where they are not tampered with or else the trap itself can become a source of the mosquitoes. So uh, the second one is monitoring. We have to monitor these traps on a daily basis to ensure that the trap is not breached. There can be cases where rodents or other insects can bite through and release the mosquitoes which have been trapped. And the data analysis should be done in consultation with experts. So the, uh, I am sure that this kind of mosquito trapping is being done in your community. Or if you are living in a village, but there is not much trapping of mosquitoes because of the rural location or the uh, remote location, you can to set up your own traps. Okay, and they are very simple to construct. You can use a simple PET bottle to construct a trap. And you can incorporate larvicides into traps. Uh, and although this raises the issue of um, whether these larvicides will contaminate other water resources in the area. So be careful when you use larvicides. A basic trap should suffice. So after you have enumerated the mosquitoes, this is when you can apply the chemicals or the mitigations. For instance, if you enumerated the mosquitoes and you found only one uh, mosquito in the entire set of 10,000, which is actually carrying the virus, you don't have to apply drastic measures. Okay, You can take uh, measures based on what is known as adequacy of your controls. Okay, There are many uh, controls which can be utilized. So the most common is physical barriers, uh, nets, of course, but mosquitoes always get through the net. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Elimination of breeding sites. This is difficult if you are living in close proximity to, for example, a forested area. It's difficult. The other ones are the chemicals, for example, citronella oils. In fact, a test was done by some companies with commercial, with different kinds of commercial brands of these um, chemicals. So citronella is one of the most effective, but you have to check whether you have allergies to citronella or not. There are chemical controls as well. Pyrethins, which are derived from flowers and the pyrethroids, which are the chemical derivatives. And then we have, as I mentioned earlier, the biological controls, which are Wolbachia, GMOs, and another one, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. This is actually a bacterium, which produces a crystal. So when the mosquito ingests this Bacillus thuringiensis, it will enter into the gut and it will kill the mosquito, but it will not be kill us because our gut is essentially acidic. So managing vectors is a continuous process. It is not a one-off process and it constantly requires uh, people's participation. And that is the purpose of this particular presentation is to encourage you to participate in the process of eliminating vectors. It, it also requires commitment from the authorities to long-term mitigation and uh, adequate surveillance and intervention because surveillance although you can set up traps you still require experts who will do the the identification of the mosquitoes as well as the pcr or the other molecular testing of the mosquitoes to determine if they are carrying the virus themselves and it's also based of course on funding so with that i would like to end my presentation thank you very much for listening we will open up for question and answers and let us all strive to build a safer world. Vasudaiva Kutumbakam. Thank you very much.